So it's uh, it's time to begin. Um, John Cock and I are very pleased to start off this first meeting of the fall, the Economic Policy Working Group. And uh, we couldn't be more pleased to have Peter Ireland and uh, Mickey Levy, Peter from Boston College and Mickey from Berenberg Capital, but both members of the Shadow Open Market Committee. And I learned that in some sense, this is a outgrowth of, of a collaboration from that uh, excellent group. So uh, the paper is titled Substantial Progress in quotes, transitory versus permanent and the appropriate calibration of monetary policy. So uh, we're gonna lead off with the presenters and uh, then we'll, so you'll have the, put your, you can use the chat if you have questions or raise your hand, whatever you wanna do. I think that It'd be better if we have just clarification questions during the presentation and the more nitty gritty. I think it's possibly me. Questions and answers, if that's okay. So uh, any 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 comments or let's get going. Go ahead, guys. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll begin. You know, and, and just start out by saying, um, you know, so the, the the U.S. economy and labor markets have recovered much more quickly and strongly uh, than earlier expected, inflation is surprised to the upside and is significantly above the Fed's 2% target. Can these data be reconciled with the Fed's highly accommodative monetary stance? Yes, with reference to the Fed's new strategic framework, but this reconciliation uh, is a very uneasy one, raising deeper questions. Has the Fed forgotten lessons from past monetary history and theory? Has the Fed's implementation of its new strategic plan reintroduced an inflationary bias? So we begin with an assessment of labor markets and looking at it from every angle, we find conditions right now are very similar to mature, to, to, to mature or even end cycle stages of prior cycles and labor markets are showing stresses. Um, when we look at inflation, the sharp rise in inflation certainly reflects some temporary factors, but it also reflects strong aggregate demand uh, that risks persistent inflation remaining well above 2%. And then we conclude, uh, Peter concludes with, with um, suggestions for guidelines to enhance the Fed's new strategic plan it would better achieve the Fed's dual mandate. So let's look at labor markets. And once again, so I, in some recent research, created an expanded labor market dashboard that Yellen started in 2014 when she was Fed chair. And I made it as inclusive as possible to be consistent with the Fed's current mandate. And what I found looking at employment, unemployment, labor force participation rates, employment to population ratios, different groups, broad measures like U6, um, you have to define it as, as substantial progress, um, despite labor market shortages. So if you look at employment, it's recovered 75% of the pandemic uh, collapse. The unemployment rate you see here has fallen back closely when you look at labor force participation rates for uh, diverse groups, um, black people, Hispanic people, uh, they're all moving commensurately in the, in the right direction. The broad measure U6 has declined uh, very sharply. And um, so I would say um, substantial progress has absolutely been made looking at the wide array of data. Now, I'd like to point out labor shortages um, amid strong demand. And this is quite striking. The latest uh, JOLTS report, which is a, a month lagged with the data, um, it shows record-breaking 10.9 million job openings and 6.7 million new hires, both of them record-breaking levels. The gap of 4.2 million represents 84% of the total shortfall from the prior peak in employment. And remember that prior peak had the unemployment rate at 3.5%. And it was after, it was at the conclusion of, of the longest expansion in history. 
And this, this basically suggests there's strong demand, aggregate demand in the economy and demand for labor and shortages that really are unrelated to monetary policy. Okay, now what this, what this table shows is the, the, how the, the, the Fed sequence of forecasts of the unemployment rate, the, the first numeric column shows the unemployment rate at the time the Fed made their quarterly SEP forecast. And you can see the unemployment rate has fallen much faster than the Fed had originally forecast. And secondly, when you look at their forecast for the year 2022, 2023, and, and for, for the last observation, we could add a column for 2024, the, the, the FOMC's median member forecast to the unemployment rate, based on what they're told is, uh, they're supposed to assume um, appropriate monetary policy, the unemployment rate is well below their estimate of, of U star. Okay, next slide, please. So I'm gonna switch over to inflation. And as you know, it has, it has soared. Um, I mean, the, the, on the left, the CPI 5.2%, the core uh, 4.2, the, the, the PCE 4.2 and the core 3.6. And I, what I don't show here is um, the PPI for final demand, 8.3% um, year over year, 6.3% uh, on the core. And when you look at the six month annualized growth of the CPI, the PCE price index and the PPI, the six month annualized is above the um, year over year suggesting acceleration. So what this shows is the sequence of the Fed's forecasts of um, inflation beginning with September, 2020, okay? And, and what, what really jumps out here is two things. Firstly is the inflation has gone up just dramatically more than they had earlier forecast, once again, based on what the FOMC members perceive to be appropriate monetary policy. Um, and secondly, the other thing that just absolutely jumps out is however much they've revised up their forecasts for uh, inflation in 2021, uh, their forecasts of 2022, 2023, and now 2024 have remained fairly closely anchored to 2%. You know, I, I, I I just find this, this striking. Next chart, next page. Okay, so, so once again, um, the Fed, the, the FOMC forecasts inflation to decelerate back. And by the way, if you go back to, to as late as December of last year, the high end of the range of FOMC members um, was 2.3% for inflation for this year. Okay, now, but as this has occurred, you know, the, so the Fed keeps its intermediate term forecast of inflation anchored to 2%, but aggregate demand has strengthened significantly along with supply constraints. And um, you know, so if we think about the forecast for 2022 and 2023, they've been virtually invariant to monetary policy. They've been unaffected by their forecasts that the unemployment rate's gonna fall decidedly below the, the, the natural rate of unemployment. I would also note they've associated with this forecast persistent uh, strong real GDP growth forecast such that um, the GDP gap disappears and, and then I would emphasize also these inflation forecasts by FOMC members have been unaffected by the unprecedented fiscal stimulus. And so these forecasts, um, you know, they're, they're, they, they, they hinge critically on the assertion that inflation 
is due nearly exclusively to supply constraints. I note that in the last week, about five Fed members, have, including Chair Powell, have given speeches where they only mention supply constraints and don't mention aggregate demand or monetary policy. And they seem based on hope and don't really reflect the risks. And, and I would just note, if monetary and fiscal policies stimulate demand like they're supposed to, then there are definite yes. risks of inflation. Okay, now I'd like to uh, conclude before I turn it over to Peter on just a few observations about inflationary expectations. And so the Fed's comfort with the current, its current policy rests on its, its perception that it has, it can efficiently manage inflationary expectations. And, but we know inflationary expectations have, have risen significantly. Um, you know, the, 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 the tips break evens are two and a half percent. The inflation expectations implied by the inflation swaps, pretty much similar to that. But um, survey measures, um, Federal Reserve Bank of New York survey of, of consumer expectations, one year had 5.2 and three year had 4%. Um, but what seems to get less um, attention from the Fed, but it's, it's unobservable and extremely difficult to quantify, is the, the inflation to date plus rising inflationary expectations seem to be influencing wage and price setting behavior, maybe even more so than is implied by the break evens on the tips. And so, um, Everything I hear from within businesses, both large, medium, and small, is that their investors are asking them one question, uh, what's your strategy in response to um, higher operating costs? And their, their, their common response has been, um, we are planning on rolling out a series of price increases that of course will be facilitated by strong aggregate demand. And so, you know, before I stop, I'd like to just go through a simple exercise. It's very easy once again to quantify inflationary expectations and market-based expectations. But let's think of the following. Um, let's say instead of having the job you have, you're a worker and you represent a union and you're two or three year contract is rolling over and you have to sit down with your CEO who you have good relations with and, and, the, and the CEO, he or she gives you an outline of what they're proposing and, and it has 2% inflation built into it for the next three years. And, you, and your first response is going to be, wait a second, um, we would like, uh, a catch up to uh, following the higher than expected inflation that's generated declining real wages for us in the last year. And, and, and we think inflation's going to be average 4% over the next couple of years. And then it becomes a negotiation and so on and so forth. But I, I bring out this exercise because uh, as economists and, 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 and policymakers, we, we can't quantify inflationary expectations in, um, in wage and price setting behavior. Uh, we need to do more research on it, but I think it's a critically important issue. And can the Fed manage expectations that actually influence price setting, price and wage setting behavior? Um, uh, rather than just, we know it can manage expectations in, 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 um, in market-based uh, market expectations. So uh, Peter, I'll stop there and turn it over to you. Okay, thanks very much, Mickey. And thank you, John, for generously inviting us back to the sessions today. So what I'd like to do as promised is to use the data that Mickey just skillfully presented and interpreted for us in order to answer two interrelated questions. Number one, is there any way to reconcile these data with the Fed's current monetary policy stance 
which would seem highly accommodative? And if yes, what does this reconciliation tell us about the Fed's newly amended monetary policy strategy, in particular, the innovations made following the 2019 system-wide review? So in order to do this, let's take another look at the data, but this time from the special perspective provided by the Fed's new strategic plan. So first regarding employment and unemployment, there is, it seems to me, at least one key element in the Federal Reserve's new strategy that would justify holding interest rates near zero despite the dramatic fall in the unemployment rate from a peak near 15% in spring 2020, all the way down to something more like 5% today. And that is the reinterpretation that the committee has given to its employment mandate. To use the committee's own words, the employment objective is now a broad-based and inclusive goal. And hence, progress towards achieving that goal presumably can no longer be gauged as I tried to do a moment ago with reference to the aggregate unemployment rate alone. Now, one weakness of this reinterpretation, whatever good intentions might motivate it in the first place, one uh, weakness or element of incompleteness is that the FOMC has never completely enumerated the wider range of indicators for employment and unemployment that would allow an outsider to look at the data as Mickey tried to do and say definitively, well, how far from or close to achieving the broad-based and inclusive objective might we be right now or at any other time? Nevertheless, committee members have been quite clear in my view in stating their own assessments and conclusions. They say the broad-based objective has still not yet been achieved. So my point here is that we certainly can't accuse the FOMC of sneakiness or inconsistency. They're doing now exactly what they said they would do in August 2020 when they first released the amended long run monetary policy strategy statement. Nevertheless, this comparison between the data that Mickey reviewed, the current policy stance and monetary policy strategy, it does raise some cause for concern. For starters, the SEPs that Mickey referred to earlier, they show unemployment running below the long run natural rate for at least three years, starting in 2022. To that point, I would add one more of my own, which is even at 5.2%, the unemployment rate may already be below the economy's natural rate. I say that because one of the key lessons that we learn from modern macroeconomics is that natural rates of output, of, inf uh, of interest, and of employment or unemployment, they can vary over time, sometimes by a lot, sometimes even at high frequency, but especially when the economy is being hit by important shocks from the supply side, which certainly seems to be true right now. The data, anecdotal and quantitative that Mickey reviewed on wages and on unfilled job postings are certainly consistent with the view that the labor market is already running hot. And then go back to the SEPs and we see the committee intends to continue to allow the labor market to run hot for at least three more years. And here we see where the gamble lies. The gamble is that today's FOMC can skillfully exploit a favorable Phillips curve trade-off in order to achieve what Arthur Burns famously or infamously called prosperity without inflation. So will they succeed? Well, maybe, hopefully, but on the other hand, Burns' own bitter history suggests cause for concern. So let's turn next to inflation. A second key feature of the Fed's new strategy, it seems to me, could also justify holding interest rates near zero despite rising inflation. And that, of course, is average inflation targeting or AIT. Now, in general, AIT strikes me as quite a sensible idea. If inflation has been running for a while below 2%, it probably does make sense 
to ask the committee to aim a little bit higher for a period of time to bring average inflation back to 2%. Again, however, a weakness here is the element of incompleteness. The committee has never described the AIT strategy in sufficient detail so as to allow an outsider to look carefully at the data and judge for him or herself how much of a makeup for past misses has been achieved, how much has yet to be achieved. Nonetheless, once more, committee members have been pretty clear in stating their own conclusions. When they say the current burst of inflation will be transitory rather than persistent, well, really what they mean are two things. First, they mean that some of this is just transitory effects of lingering logistical constraints associated with the waning pandemic that will continue to wear off as we get back to normal. But part of it must also be that they're comfortable with a little extra inflation now as makeup for misses on the downside in the past. So what's the problem then? Well, besides the elements of incompleteness that I noted earlier, another problem, it just has to do with the language. Because whether they realize it or not, when committee members frame the problem or the question in this way, transitory versus persistent, they're echoing almost exactly language that got used during the 1970s to excuse central bankers for the important task of controlling inflation. Another way of putting it is by asking transitory versus persistent, committee members risk pushing too far into the background the important role that monetary policy itself plays in determining which outcome we eventually see. So think again about time-varying natural rates. This is a point that Bob Hetzel has made emphatically in some of his own recent papers, which I'd encourage you all to look at. But as the economy continues to recover, the Wixellian natural rate is gonna to start to rise. The scenario where the Fed Reserve tracks upward movement in the natural rate with movement in its own policy rates, that is the scenario where inflation turns out to be transitory. The scenario, on the other hand, when the Fed waits too long, holding interest rates too low in the face of a rising natural rate, that is the scenario where inflation proves unwanted and persistent. Now, again, to be perfectly fair, FOMC members say this. They say, we have the tools to correct for an unwanted and persistent overshoot in inflation should we see it in the data. True enough and fair enough. And yet, you have to wonder about the language. They have the tools, what they must mean is we stand ready to raise interest rates. But if they can't say those words today, if they must speak euphemistically, you have to wonder, Will they have the fortitude to take actions to actually raise rates if changing economic circumstances demand higher rates, perhaps as soon as early to mid 2022? So in conclusion, if you try and take a step back and ask, where do these elements of incompleteness really come from? And where do these new risks of a persistent overshoot, where do they come from too? I think you'll see the following. If you go back to the changes that the FOMC made to its long-run monetary policy strategy in the aftermath of the 2019 review, all of those changes represent perfectly reasonable responses to perceived difficulties the committee faced. And here's the key, conducting monetary policy effectively in the aftermath of the previous recession in 2008, 2009, when overwhelmingly the biggest challenge was delivering sufficient monetary accommodation to offset perceived severe deflationary pressures when confronted with a zero lower interest rate bound. The problem is that now these new strategic elements are being put in play, implemented under macroeconomic conditions that seem very, very different. And the shifting macroeconomic winds, if you will, have worked to expose elements of incompleteness that were always there, but now seem more salient, more serious sources of risk. So last question, 
How can the FOMC address these elements of incompleteness while retaining the advantages and desirable features of the new framework? Well, by doing two things, we think. Justifying average inflation targeting to make clear that AIT should work to prevent not only persistent undershoots of inflation below target, but also persistent overshoots of inflation above target. And there are several different ways the committee could go about this. They could announce a specific monetary policy rule that builds into its specification AIT instead of traditional inflation targeting. They could announce a multi-year target path for the level of prices or nominal GDP. That's a possibility that Mickey and I explore in the paper we prepared for today's session. Now, I realize the FOMC isn't going to do either of those things, but it could, as an alternative, do the usual thing. Committee members could use their words. They could incorporate into committee statements into their individual speeches scenarios describing circumstances in which a policy response to contain an upward movement in inflation, again, might be needed as soon as next year. At the same time they fortify AIT, the FOMC should do a second thing, equally if not more important. They should remind themselves, I think, as well as the public, that preemptive actions taken to stabilize average inflation support rather than jeopardize pursuit of the broad-based and inclusive employment goals. We know that from experience during the great moderation, and we saw it again in the second half of the recovery that eventually did follow 2008-2009. So in summary, we certainly encourage the FOMC to proceed with plans for tapering asset purchases for four years end. But we would also suggest, perhaps even more so, that the committee announce guidelines for raising interest rates as soon as early to mid 2022, should changing circumstances demand those higher rates. Thanks. I'm sorry, inviting Mickey to conclude. Yeah, okay, to... yeah, thanks, John. I just wanted to conclude with just a few observations. It's, it's quite striking that it's been just a little over a year since the Fed rolled out its new strategy. Um, and I'd just like to highlight two observations implicit in Peter's comments and in the paper and, and, and in mine. And one is uh, we've had this unprecedented surge in M2 or any other measure of broad money possible, but you've also, during the pandemic, you had a collapse in um, money velocity. And secondly, personal saving has soared. And the, so the, the contraction in M2 was much more than predicted by a standard money demand equation. And there needs to be a lot more research done on this. Secondly, um, you know, so, so John Taylor's recent research showed that a sizable portion of the government's uh, fiscal supports to individuals was saved consistent with a permanent income hypothesis. So we're at a very interesting inflection point on both of these issues as we look forward, I would say the story's not over. Is the jump in personal savings permanent or will it be spent and boost demand involving a recovery of velocity? So a lot of research that needs to be done. Um, Mike Bordeaux, his re recent research uh, gets, puts a historic perspective on it and shows that post-World War II, while money supply growth from the war slowed, there was a, there was a pent up demand and a surge in velocity that didn't occur following the financial crisis in 2008-9. Um, Charlie Plosser reminds us that while the Fed has abandoned the, the Phillips curve as, as a reliable predictor of inflation, the Fed hasn't replaced it with, with any other framework. So th th amid these macro, uncertainties, I, I just think they highlight the, the importance of the Fed adopting a more systematic guideline rather than you know, relying on, on pure discretion and acknowledging the risks. Okay, thank you, Mickey. Um, so this is time for the Q&A, so raise your mechanical hand or jump in. 
Uh, I see Larry Meyer has a question, Larry. Okay, uh, Peter and Mickey, don't take this personally, but I appreciate that you have written a paper that I almost completely disagree with. Uh, that makes it so much more interesting to make a few comments on it. Now, I, I think we begin with the, the notion that this high inflation is a supply-driven phenomenon, uh, not a demand-driven. But you sometimes conflate the imbalance of supply and demand in markets facing bottlenecks with aggregate demand and supply. No, not at all. That you have to get rid of. Um, what's the worst part of your paper? Uh, you're you're uh, uh, suggesting that Jay Powell is uh, Arthur Burns, or might be Arthur Burns. Come on. He's the worst chair in the history. He didn't even know that monetary policy had anything to do with inflation. So forget about that. That's just... Uh, the second worst part is mentioning money and velocity. I haven't used those words in 25 years. I don't think they have anything to do with inflation. Um, if they did, uh, MIT would take my PhD back. Um, okay, so here's some specific comments. You talk about makeup with respect to the uh, new monetary policy framework. There is no makeup in this. Clarita said, no, we toyed with it at the beginning, but in the end, there's very little, there's little to no makeup in this, okay? I understand the Fed has been very bad at communicating this, uh, but that's the reality. Uh, second, uh, this notion of temporary is underpinned by the distinction between a price level shock supply-driven price level shock and a inflation shock. Price level shocks go away. By the way, we face a powerful disinflationary force here because what goes up comes down. Motor vehicle prices are not going to stay up there. They're going to come down. We got to remember that. Um, you misrepresent the role of the Phillips curve uh, and the Nairo. You know, I have something to say about that. In the new framework, and from the first Powell speech, um, there is no role for an estimate of the Nairu in the new in the new framework. The Nairu is defined as the unemployment rate at which inflation moves up to and threatens to go above two percent. It's based on experience, not an estimate. Okay. Um, with respect to inflation expectations, uh, I hope you've all seen the paper by Jeremy Rudd. And uh, if you have, John, I hope you invite him to, uh, to give a talk. It's really fantastic. You also, uh, uh, I understand why from the communication, but you misrepresent the role of maximum employment completely. Uh, as Clarita said, maximum employment is the highest level of employment that doesn't threaten the price stability objective. It's the Nairu in different clothes, okay? Um, and then finally, what is this paper really about? I think it was about price level targeting and nominal income targeting. I think that's where we were all headed. Uh, the FOMC threw out nominal income targeting before they began the review. And the first thing that went in the review was to throw price level targeting off the table. Okay, thank you for giving me that opportunity, John. So any comments? Uh... Mickey or Peter on that? Peter, go ahead. Thanks, Larry, for those helpful uh, comments. I, I, I guess, I mean, there's, I, I'd rather keep things open for, for other people to chime in with their views as well. I, I guess what I would say is um, our, our intent, though, was not to compare Jerome Powell to Arthur Burns. It was to simply um, in a sense, support the efforts that Jay Powell has been making and might make in the future so as to avoid repetition of the mistakes of Arthur Burns. More generally, our concern is that the macroeconomic environment and the political and social environment today replicate in some eerie ways what we saw during the 1960s when the Fed Reserve came under pressure to allow the upward drift in inflation. So this is not a criticism of anything that the Fed has done so far, 
Um, it's simply a set of warnings intended to support the Fed in its ability to avoid making the mistakes of the past. Thanks, Peter. So Ellen Mead is on the list. Ellen, welcome. Yes, thanks. Um, thanks very much for the presentation, um, Mickey and Peter. I very much enjoyed uh, listening to it. I had uh, one comment on the SEP as uh, Mickey was outlining it and talking about uh, the uh, invariance, if you will, of the out years of inflation and unemployment in the forecast. And the way I usually think of it is you know, the current year forecast gets updated as new data come in. Um, but what's going, what's getting adjusted in the out years is monetary policy, because each individual is submitting these forecasts uh, under his or her own assumptions about um, the best policy. And if you, you know, you can best see this if you look at the individual forecasts, which aren't really in the current SEP, but they are released with a lag. So you could go look at 2012 when the interest rates were introduced up through 2015, which is currently available, and look at the individual forecast paths. And what you would see is adjustment of interest rates uh, You know, each time the SEP is submitted as a way of getting you back to your goals. And I know, John, you have Charlie Plosser and Jeff Lacker on the seminar, so maybe they would feel that they wanted to comment on that. And I'll stop. Thank you very much. Alan, I, you know, I would just say I, I understand that that um, that the that the median SEP is is based on individual members and they're they're supposed to assume appropriate monetary policy, but the um, the the general forecasts um, of of inflation uh, settling back down and closely anchored to to two percent. It happens to be absolutely consistent with what the members are saying publicly. And uh, I, I do note that um, in all their discussions now, there's very little discussion about, when we think about inflation, there's very little discussion about how monetary policy affects aggregate demand. And that seems to be a missing element. And so I was just, I, I was just struck by how the Fed adjusts its near-term inflation just arithmetically and doesn't change at all. It's out, it's further out forecast and that's what the public hears. And I know it's part of their forward guidance. So maybe it's a communications problem, but it, it's definitely a problem that doesn't capture any of the, it, it doesn't capture the risks the way uh, they should. Uh, John Cochran has a question and then Dick. Thanks guys, this was great. Uh, <clears throat> and and I, what I love about this is you're helping us to get in the head of the Fed, which is what I'll probe with a couple of questions. I just wanna highlight uh, something Peter said I thought was lovely, how the current strategy review is a beautiful marginal line <clears throat> with which to fight deflation. Uh, leaving us open to the fact that they're going to come around the right flank instead. Uh, and the second thing, uh, both of you sort of said, uh, the Fed keeps saying it has the tools. What are those tools, guys? <clears throat> uh, the Fed says uh, we're going to manage expectations. How? <clears throat> well, the only way how is to say, should inflation come, we're ready to replay 1980. But the fact that they're not even willing to say that in public is a little bit uh, concerning. Uh, on how the Fed thinks about things, um, uh, I notice a, a lack of thinking about supply. Uh, you mentioned the bottlenecks, which is sort of supply constraints, but the COVID recession should be slapping us in the face. Your graph was beautiful. We've never seen anything like this before, uh, both in how quick it went up and how quick it back, came down again. And it's, it's not, the COVID recession was about all sorts of things, but it wasn't a lack of aggregate demand. Uh, and the Fed still does not seem to be thinking, all central banks think all there is ever is demand, nothing like supply. But the fact that people were sick, <clears throat> the fact that now pe people were, or until recently people were paid not to go back to work, uh, ought to have something in, in your thinking about macroeconomic dynamics, but it seems to just be 
stimulus and, and, and demand uh, always. Does the Fed think one part of the transitory is the, uh, the, the fact was our government printed up a ton of money, sent it to people. That money sits in people's bank accounts. Those people are gonna spend it. <clears throat> the price level is gonna go up and it's kind of over. I think that is a story in the back of the Fed's mind. Let's call it a state contingent default, uh, a one-time thing about uh, how this is, why it's gonna be transitory. I'm curious if you sense that thinking in the Fed. And last question, I promise John, this is the last question. You mentioned that the Fed doesn't take the Phillips curve seriously anymore as a forecaster of inflation, which I agree with. But it is interesting that the Fed takes the static Phillips curve so seriously now as the determinant of unemployment. After all, the new strategy says we're going to run inflation hot for a while to drive down on unemployment. This is the 1961 Phillips curve straight out of uh, Dobin and Solo uh, with no expectations or anything else. So that's kind of a, another little bit of a schizophrenia. Anyway, on those lines, if there's more you can tell us about how the Fed is thinking about the world, I'd be glad to hear. I think the, the Fed, and, and Rich Claret has, has articulated this, that it's very difficult to forecast inflation. Uh, Powell and others at the Fed have said, you know, the, the Phillips curve is flat. Um, and they've, as they've, the, the, the Phillips curve seemingly play a d diminished role in, 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 in forecasting inflation the role of inflationary expectations is, is heightened. And on, on this point, you know, we have to think about a year ago, um, it, a, a year ago when, when GDP was five percentage points below where it had been pre-pandemic, um, I think some of the Fed, the Fed strategy made sense, and now it's continued to grow. The uh, real and nominal GDP are above where they were, and if we think about the the, the new strategic plan and it, how to reconcile it with the current policies and where we are in the in the expansion. Wait, wait, um, wait. You said that a year ago it made sense when GDP was 5% below, which is right if the reason GDP is low is lack of aggregate demand. But a year ago, the if you can get people all the money they you want to, they, they're not going to go to a restaurant because the restaurant's closed. No, fair enough. And that, John, that's, I mean, that's why I, in, my, in my concluding remarks, I brought up the point that we, we have, you know, so much more personal savings than pre-pandemic and yeah. it's sitting in bank accounts earning zero, is that the end of the story? And, and I would say it's not the end of the story. And if, you, if, if we consider the pipeline of monetary and fiscal stimulus right now, um, forget about what might be passed within a week, um, you, you can't assume that the, the nominal GDP is just going to simmer back down to its pre-pandemic rate and inflation is going to come back down to 2%. Let, let me, let me we have to move lots of questions uh, if, we, if we could keep going. Dick Kovacevic has a question. Dick, that welcome. Thank you, John. Uh, so uh, if I remember correctly, 100 years ago when I was uh, a student at Stanford, <laughs> Anytime I heard inflation, I automatically heard the word Milton Friedman. And Milton Friedman convinced me back then that uh, all inflation is, is determined by money supply. And if I'm correct, the money supply in the last uh, couple of years has been growing at like 20%. It hasn't grown at 20% since World War II. And so, if we don't have persistent inflation, does that mean Milton Friedman was wrong? That's a great question. And the way I would answer it, and this builds on Mickey's final comments, the, the issue of whether, okay, first of all, as Larry Meyer implied in his questioning, okay, an increase in the money supply in levels even in theory, would not translate into a persistent increase in inflation. 
just a one-time increase in the price level. But as you pointed out, we're talking about a 20% or more increase. So that, that's a huge increase in the level, one-time increase in the level. What I would say, coming under the question, does this mean that infl higher inflation measured inflation is coming for sure? I would say it all depends. It depends on what? It depends on how the Federal Reserve conducts monetary policy as we move into 2022 and beyond. One way of looking at it is in reference to natural rates, but we can also look at it through a Friedman-esque quantity theoretic framework. Okay, the scenario where the Fed Reserve gradually raises rates as needed in 2022 is the scenario where firms repay lines of credit that they drew on at the beginning of the pandemic. And it is the scenario where consumers use some of the money that they've saved to pay down debt. The bulge in the money supply goes down. And so we don't see the inflation but it's simply because the bulge in the money supply will be you know, worked off through the repayment of debt. The scenario where the Fed holds interest rates too low for too long is the scenario where individuals, instead of using their excess money balances to pay down debt, spend it instead. And then we do get the increase in the price level. So it all depends, but it depends in an important way, in a crucial way on monetary policy. Oh, I want to just, just say something. Uh, if you can see behind me over my shoulder, there's a California license plate. It says MV equals PY. Those are Milton's plates. <laughs> I love having behind me. And the equal John. sign, he put in the equal sign with tape and the California Highway Patrol would say, take off the equal sign. So he did, but the next day they were back on. Anyway, next question, Elena Pestorino. Elena. Thank you, John. So thank you, Peter. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. yes. Yes, Can, yes. Yeah. Thank you, Mickey and Peter for the talk. I, I wanted to ask you this question and ties back to a beautiful talk that John Taylor gave a few days ago in Memoria of Dave Backus. And so we talk about often strategy and action space for the Fed, uh, especially in light of the review that has just been conducted the past year. And my question is about incentives. The Fed now holds a whole huge amount of assets. And we talk about accommodative monetary policy, but what is the incentive of the Fed to effectively increase uh, rates in light of this portfolio? What, what, what's your thinking about this? I, it ties I also back with the ability to manage inflation expectations because we know it has its strong incentives not to raise rates. Well, Elena, I, I don't think the balance sheet comes into play with its ability. It, it uses it as, as forward guidance. Um, I think the, the, the incentive for the Fed is to um, prevent inflationary expectations from becoming unanchored to two percent, or or whatever level where where it seems to become unanchored, that's why you know. Other than that, I don't see any incentives for the Fed to wind down its balance sheet. It's been very reticent to raise rates because it doesn't want to to scare financial markets, because it knows it'll get if anything goes wrong, it'll it'll get get the blame. Um, but I, I would I would just add that there's there's a risk of having such a high balance sheet, and and we could unfortunately be seeing that played out as, as Congress deliberates on on the the you know the debt ceiling. Um, there is a, a, a risk to financial stability of of keeping rates at at zero, and. Um, yeah, I, I just think the Fed is not thinking about these risks as it as it calculates what strategy to play. And let me let me add one other point, and this maybe gets ties together a, a few other things. When when we think about the, the 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 impetus, the Fed's impetus for the new strategic plan, 
it was not that inflation was 1.8 or 1.7. It was its concern that if it stayed there, you could have uh, inflationary expectations collapse, which which would um, put push yield you know interest rates down to the zero lower bound. And and I would note now, fast forward to where we are. The, the, the feds, that's fighting an old battle. That's not the concern. It's not thinking in terms of risk management and the, the upside risks, the downside risks when it, when it considers its, its strategy now. Yeah, great, thank you. Thank you. So the paper um, doesn't draw a distinction between the August 2020 revised statement and the September 2020 forward guidance. And I think this distinction is, is really important. And so Peter mentioned policy rules. And last fall at a session here where actually Peter and I both spoke, I talked about policy rules that would be consistent with the revised Statement, statement, and in particular consistent with, say, Jay Powell's 3.5 unemployment, and then some measure of inflation above the 2%. That doesn't matter much. Now, if you take, to take that framework and, and think, okay, the Fed does, is going to ignore 2021 inflation, just make that 2%, just, 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 just ignore that, call that's all transitory, what does that kind of policy rule prescribe? Answer is that if it's a Taylor rule, September 2021, or the Fed should have raised rates last week. If it's a balanced approach rule with a higher coefficient on the unemployment gap, it's March of 2022, two quarters later. And so this type of rule, what this does, or any type, of Taylor type policy rule has the property that once you get to, once once you get to your goals, then you're at the neutral nominal rate. The goals can be different. It can be four percent unemployment. It can be three three point five. It can be that doesn't matter. Whatever your goals are, you're there. Forward guidance says when you reach your or, or FOMC forward guidance guidance says when you reach your goals, you that's when you first go above zero. I think that's a huge difference between uh, b between where you would be at that point in terms of potential for monetary policy and future inflation. Let me just ask one other led one other thing is brings me back to Rob Kaplan's dissent at the September 2020 meeting where he voted in favor of the revised statement, voted in August, voted against the forward guidance and reason why is he didn't want to turn to tie the hands of future committee committees. And I think in retrospect, retrospect, he really got that one, one right. Yeah, those are excellent points. Thanks, David. Uh, another way that I would put it would be to say our perspective in the paper, or at least mine is, you know, I don't really care what the specific the details of the rule may be or exactly what the base is for a multi-year price level target, so much as some systematic rule be put in place or some elaboration on the AIT be made that guards against overshoots as well as undershoots. But you're right, what your paper from last year skillfully shows is that some of these details or what might seem like details could make a big difference. And so the risks may be even higher, but I fully One agree. really quick thing, how do you guard against overshoot? You not only have to say you have the tools, you not only have to say you raise interest rates, you have to say you follow the Taylor principle. Yes, I think, exactly. I think we'll all agree on, about, on, 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 on that. That's really crucial. Yes, exactly. But, but David, let me let me add that in the new strategic plan, the Fed basically uh, eschewed, you know, dropped um, any pretense to preemptive tightening, and and so that, um, in a sense, that was not only did it not put numeric targets on any of its either side of its dual mandate, it basically says we are not going to tighten preemptively. We're not going to tighten 
preemptively based on unemployment rates being under the natural rate via the 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 the, the, the Phillips curve. We're going to wait to to, to see what hap what happens with inflation. And saying doing that, they still should be tightening, and 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 they and, and they should be tightening 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 very 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 soon. And if you go and take a Taylor rule in the same kind of framework, you're only a couple of quarters difference. It would be early 2021 instead of now. That, 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 that's not big, that's not, a, in terms of the policy wolf way of thinking about it, that's not a big distinction. So let's hear from uh, Tyler Goodspeed, Tyler. Sure, thanks, thanks very much. I, I was just wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit more about expectations and whether you think it's important at the moment to maybe be paying more attention to certain measures of, of expectations rather than others, because one of the things that has recently struck me, looking back to the 60s and the 1970s, is that if we take the oldest continuous series of professional forecasters of inflation, the, the Livingston survey, overall, professional forecasters have smaller forecast errors than, than consumers except for two periods, the inflationary period of the late 60s and early 1970s, and then the, def the, the decelerating uh, inflation of, of the 1980s. So it, does, it seems to be that consumers, even though in, in periods of moderation are, are worse than professional forecasters at forecasting inflation, they seem to be a bit better at detecting a regime change. Tyler, I mean, I know the Fed considers and develops an index based on a wide array of inflationary expectations. And I'm, I'm surprised, you know, the, I'm surprised the Fed's been so sanguine um, that, you know, before the pandemic, uh, inflationary expectations were around 1.6. That's what the break evens on the, on, on the, the, the tips break evens on the fives. And they moved up to 2.4 and other indicators seem well above that. And um, meanwhile, the Fed has, um, you know, kind of stretched the definition of temporary and real wages now are declining. And, um, and, and, and I, I guess I'm surprised the Fed's so sanguine. And it's, I think it's sanguine because it still believes it can manage inflationary expectations. But then as Peter emphasizes, they talk about the tools, but they don't seem to, to, to do them. And then the question is, why? Why are they making such a big deal about tapering ass, asset purchases with, with an eight and a half trillion dollar portfolio, is it going to have any impact if they buy 105 billion new a month versus 120? They're making a big deal about it, whereas the real focus should be, you know, when are they going to um, take the steps to raise interest rates? I, th I think it would actually uh, improve the health of, of financial markets. Hey, can I follow up really quickly on, on the central question, though? Why are the markets going one way and the surveys going the other way? Why are long-term bonds still so low? Yeah, yes. I, when, when we started writing the paper and discussing the ideas, I sent an email to Mickey and said, Mickey, you know, I, I think we agree on all of these things. There's this one thing that's nagging me. You know, Friedman was gone when I got to Chicago, but professors Lucas and Fama were there. And I can, you know, do you really think you can outguess the markets? I mean, to me, on one level, the 10-year treasury rate, it just seems unbelievably low, okay? But do you want to bet against the markets? To, to me, it's, it is a mystery. Let's hear from Charlie Plusser. Charlie? Uh, thank, thank you, John. I, I want to come back to uh, Ellen's point about the SEPs. And Jeff may remember some of this, but as one of the ones who was on the communications committee back in 2000 and I don't know, a long time ago, 
<laughs> that helped come up with the dot plots. The thing that has disturbed me, or one of the things that has disturbed me about the chairman's discussion of the SEPs is his mischaracterization of them. In every press conference since June, uh, the chairman has said something to the effect that, well, all the inflation is temporary. It's lumbers, automobiles, whatever. And, and as you can see from the from the uh, SEPs, the committee's view is that this, this inflation is really come down. That's wrong. That is an incorrect statement about what the SEPs are saying. As Ellen pointed out, the SEPs are a statement about what the committee members think will happen under appropriate policy. And the fact of the matter is that in every meeting, the dots have risen in the out years, and in some cases risen quite a bit. So the reason you see the SEP quote forecast coming down is in part because the committee is raising the tightness of policy by raising interest rates, not because they necessarily think it's transitory, but they think that policy will have to respond to get inflation back down to the target. And Jay Powell has misrepresented that in every press conference, at least since June, because I've listened to him. So it's very frustrating to me for, uh, to listen to the commentary that basically ignores policy that Jay Powell every time talks about lumber prices or automobile prices, never once talks about the role of policy. And that is wrong. And absolving themselves of the responsibility that they have for price stability, not to address the question of what role policy may or may not be doing uh, to inflation, because I believe, as Mickey alluded to, that to the extent that this, uh, these supply side shocks, if you will, or whatever you want to call them, to the extent that it's more persistent, is going to be determined by the path of monetary and fiscal policies. And the Fed refuses to talk about that and therefore refuses to be held accountable for what the path of inflation may end up choosing to be. And as much as those of us on the Fed who helped develop the dot plots tried to keep reminding people that these, are, these, these uh, forecasts are the result of individual members appropriate policy, you cannot take those forecasts as if they were unconditional forecasts. You have to look at them in the context of what policy is doing. And people keep doing that, and I don't think it's right. And I think Powell has abused that. He either doesn't understand it, which I find it hard to believe, or the staff is allowing him to make those kinds of comments, which are really incorrect. The other thing I'd like to say is that um, uh, my problems with the new system, and I may talk about this more in a month or two, but um, is the Fed has designed a framework and its forward guidance for which the current situation, that is inflation along with uh, unacceptable unemployment, at least from their, or employment from their perspective, this, this occurrence was not in their playbook. They did not anticipate being here. And through their guidance, when they said, we will not raise rates until we reach maximum employment, ruled out 
them ever being or dealing with a situation in which actually inflation may be higher before they reached full employment. So they didn't allow for this outcome. Like I say, it wasn't in their playbook. And now they're faced with this and it's mostly all of their own making. It's because their strategic framework, I think was not well thought out and even worse, it was not articulated very well. And basically now they find themselves where they've got to wing it and play it by ear and revert to mostly discretionary policy and then try to justify it. So I think we have four, four more uh, hands raised and I want to go through those and uh, you can decide how to react. So Axel Merck, Axel. Yeah, Charlie referred to a little bit of what my question or comment is. I'm wondering to what extent you think the Fed is hostage of its own confirmation bias and forward guidance. I think, I mean, you have indicated, oh, they should talk about when they're going to raise rates. Well, I think what they're afraid of is if they were to do that, then um, the spreads would widen and they would get his uh, taper tandem. And so he's talking himself into this, oh, everything is going to be fine. And it's not just they are staying preemptively neutral. Uh, and they, they, I mean, they're staying preemptively full throttle, right? I mean, if they said we go to neutral, that would be with something. But, but I'm just wondering to what extent they are just have boxed themselves into this corner. And as Charlie points out, they just didn't take this into consideration. And now they are married to this approach and defend, defending it to the nail. I, I think there's a lot to what you just said. And I think that plus the Fed's fear that anything goes wrong, they get blamed for it. And I think the Fed has a very bad relationship with financial markets. But the, you know, so the, the, as Charlie said, they're not using it for, they're not using it as an actual forecast. They're based on their best the, 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 the appropriate policy. But Charlie, I'd like to make a point. Even if you take their, their um, the median FOMC members uh, uh, estimate for the for the the, the proper um, Fed funds rate by the end of 2024, and it's it's 1.8 percent, which is which is still well below what they estimate to be our star plus two percent. So, so Mickey, in response to that, I think that the way to think about it, and I've always said this. The information in the dot plots is not about the levels. It's about how they change over time. Mm -hmm. And what you want to infer from the dots and therefore the forecast is more of a reaction function that the committee is having to the data coming in rather than taking the levels as necessarily indicative of a forecast. And that's the to me, that's the proper way to uh, influence, to take away from these. So I don't necessarily believe that the, they've got the levels right necessarily, but what you do see is the changes. And that's really important for interpreting how the, how the projections end up falling out. Uh, Michael Borda, Chris Ersig, and Jeff Lacker. So go ahead, Michael. And so I, I just wanted to back up something that Tyler Goodspeed says. So like Ricardo Rice has this really nice Brookings paper that came out a, a few weeks ago. And, and he looks at expectations in going back to that period into the 60s and 70s. And he looks at different kinds of expectations. So the market-based ones and surveys, et cetera. And he says, he basically says what Tyler said, which is that in the periods when inflation is going up, you see that, the, that consumers that are being surveyed, they seem to think that inflation is going up, but at the same time, the, the, the markets, which in this, in this break even thing that people look at, they don't see it. So it seems to me that if we're looking at today and just what people are saying with respect to what they expect prices to do and what Mickey talks about, what, what firms are saying, seems to have some real resonance to what happened when things got out of control. Uh, decades ago. Thanks, John. So very, very, very interesting paper. I was just wondering that you know, a number of references have been made to the parallel, potential parallels to the 1960s. But I was wondering uh, if you thought about the 
um, possible parallels to the early 1950s, where there was a very large, uh, albeit transient, spike in inflation in the context of the Korean War. But because monetary policy was highly credible, uh, inflation expectations really weren't adversely affected and didn't move much. And so, uh, you know, really the Fed was able to uh, keep uh, inflation uh, expectations and inflation uh, stable in the, the aftermath. Uh, so that was just one consideration. Um, and then the second is just uh, one can imagine uh, that uh, the um, possibility of uh, returning to a very low neutral rate uh, environment where the uh, zero bound binds again you know, is very much on the minds of policymakers. And that would you know, push towards this sort of strategy where downside risks and uh, a protracted uh, you know, zero bound uh, with low inflation are the sort of risks that would militate towards uh, this strategy. So I was wondering, uh, you know, even though uh, there are certainly upside risks, you know, isn't that a material consideration uh, pointing towards accommodated strategies? Let's hear yeah. Jeff, Jeff, and you can answer uh, Chris as well. Jeff, go ahead. Jeff Blacker. Yeah, so uh, a lot's been uh, commented on about, uh, first of all, thank you to Peter and Mickey for a uh, really excellent overview of the current situation of monetary policy. Uh, a lot's been uh, talked about the, the potential for parallels to the 1960s. So obviously, aggregate demand fueled by fiscal actions has um, fueled uh, nominal demand and uh, driven it up against supply. That's quite evident then and, and now. Obviously, some industries are going to have less elastic supply curves than others. So the fact that uh, you can identify bottlenecks uh, seems immaterial as to whether you know it's an aggregate demand surge or not. It doesn't seem to me to refer to it. The other element about the 1960s and the parallel, though, is the extent to which back in the 60s, what was really problematic. What was problematic was the extent to which the Fed's ability to respond with rate increases was hampered for essentially political reasons. Now, from that point of view, the Fed's reframing of its commitment to maximum employment uh, last year is the thing that's the most troubling. They both, um, you know, kind of defined it more rigorously in terms of, you know, quantitatively what it was going to mean, going to shortfalls rather than deviations. And in addition, they broadened uh, their definition of it uh, that, again, sort of raised the bar from them. And I, I, I worry that they're, they're really boxed in by a conception of maximum employment, which this doesn't accord with the economics we know about the labor market. I mean, it's treating maximum employment as a, a fixed parameter or a parameter that just gradually uh, evolves over time. In the general equilibrium model, dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model at the board, they bring in maximum employment from outside the model because the one generated by the model responds to all the shocks in the economy everything but the monetary policy is shocks in economy, which is what we know about maximum employment. If you look back this year at this surge in inflation, it seems to me like it's the latest and most vivid evidence uh, uh, against the notion of, of maximum employment as some you know, exogenous, smoothly varying uh, parameter. I mean, it, it evidently over the summer, maximum employment was about the employment we saw. It was about actual employment. And so I, I, I think untangling that as in terms of the way people think about employment, I think is, um, it, you know, it, it leaves me far less sanguine about the Fed's ability to navigate a situation next year in which inflation remains elevated um, and yet they don't get to what they think of or what they've sold the public on as maximum employment. Well, thank you, Jeff. So Peter and Mickey, we have a few minutes to wrap up. You want, you want to do that and comment? Sure. I, I was merely just one more quick response to your excellent comments, Chris. The, the reason why we say fortify AIT is partly I have in mind exactly your concern. 
we know that in a low interest rate, low inflation environment in which the zero lower bound is a recurrent constraint on monetary policy, there are big advantages to level targeting schemes. And AIT loosely interpreted brings into the policy making framework that notion of I would only add and wish that the committee would as well, that level targeting does not preclude guarding against over persistent overshoots as well as undershoots. So th that's why in the paper in the presentation we say, or I say for, you know, fortify the new framework, don't just toss it out. Thanks Jeff for your comments too, I, I agree wholeheartedly. Hey, hey, hey Jeff, um, I think there are a lot of parallels between the current environment and the second half of the 1960s, not only was William McChesney Martin fed, you know, politically constrained to, to raise rates appropriately, but it was in an environment where activist uh, fiscal policy dominated, the Phillips curve was becoming mainstream. Fast forward to today, you have a Federal Reserve uh, that doesn't seem to need political impetus to be activist. And, um, and the parallels go on. We have seen this, this pretty sharp acceleration in nominal GDP. The critical question going forward now is, will nominal GDP growth uh, continue to remain strong? And I think it will based on the, 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 the impacts of monetary and fiscal stimulus. If that's true, you're gonna get you know, continued inflation pressures. And then one final point you know, on, on, your, on your emphasis on employment. The Fed, while it, while it, it prioritized and, and enhanced its uh, mandate for employment, at the same time, the Fed was very careful in its uh, strategy statement to say that employment is driven uh, quite a bit by non-monetary factors that are beyond its control. Hey, thank you uh, very much, Mickey and Peter, uh, for everyone being here and the terrific questions. It was a great discussion. And uh, I think we just outlined more projects for the future. So join us next time and uh, thank, thanks very much again.